is risen. The Lord is risen indeed. Alleluia. Jesus said, I am the resurrection and the life. Those who believe in me, even though they die, yet shall they live. And everyone who lives and believes in me shall never die. How wonderful it is that we worship a God who hears our prayers and now is the time for us in our worship service to lift up prayers for one another. If you would like for us to be in prayer with you, uh, notice that there are prayer cards in the pew backs in front of you. You can fill that information out and either hand it to a minister or put it in the offering plate and we will be sure to pray for you all. As we continue to worship this day, we lift up the concerns and celebrations of the congregation of which we are aware and we ask that you keep these individuals in your thoughts and prayers in the days to come. Uh, please pray for Chris Hagee who is at the, the terraces at Peachtree Hills Place and also for Richard Drain and Gary Pryor at Tucker Wellness and Rehabilitation Center. We also offer our sympathy to Stephen Crawford on the death of his mother and we offer our Christian sympathy to the family of Frank Kennett on his death. And as is our custom, when a member of our congregation passes, we stand in their memory. So if you would, please stand in memory of Frank Kennett. You may be seated. The Lord be with you. Let us pray. Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, on this Easter Sunday, we bask in your glory and the revelation that you are the risen Lord, our God. Our hope is in you as your Easter people, and we believe and proclaim you as the resurrection and the life. Lord, we praise you for coming into the world to be the word made flesh to walk among us. When we read your holy scriptures, our hearts are filled with gratitude that you came to show us how to live in a manner that is holy and pleasing to you. And we thank you for filling us with peace and contentment as we walk in your ways. Lord, enable us to recognize your holy presence in our lives and empower us to accept your divine gift of salvation. Bless us with joy as we recognize your voice calling out to us. We're grateful that we who hear and receive you and believe in your name are given the name child of God. Help us to see in our new birth as your children that death is not, has not ended your ministry your ministry of mercy and grace and your triumph over death through your resurrection are just the beginning of the newness of life for all of us. Lord, fill us with life. Please help us to see that Easter is not the dramatic conclusion of your story, but rather the beginning. Allow us to look into the depths of our hearts and minds where doubt and faith intersect and choose to live by grace through faith in you our risen Savior. Lord, give us the courage to seek you in your presence in the community of believers all year long. Enable us to see your love, to see your love poured out in us as we worship you, as we study your holy word, as we serve those in need around the world. Lord, allow us to witness your love in each other and bless us 
as your children to abide in your love forever. Bless us as a parent who loves a child. Give us an accepting, discerning, and generous heart to go into the world and proclaim the good news in your name by sharing your love with all the world. Lord, allow us to preach often and sometimes use words. Lord, thank you for blessing our souls on this glorious, holy day. May the joy we experience on this Easter Sunday go with us every day. And now, Lord, bless us as we join our voices together to pray the prayer you taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen.
Early on the first day of the week, while it was still dark, Mary Magdalene came to the tomb and saw that the stone had been removed from the tomb. So she ran and went to Simon Peter and the other disciple, the one whom Jesus loved, and said to them, they have taken the Lord out of the tomb and we do not know where they have laid him. Then Peter and the other disciples set out and went towards the tomb. The two were running together, but the other disciple outran Peter and reached the tomb first. He bent down to look in and saw the linen wrappings lying there, but he did not go in. Then Simon Peter came following him and went into the tomb. He saw the linen wrappings lying there and the cloth that had been on Jesus' head, not lying with the linen wrappings, but rolled up in a place by itself. Then the other disciple who reached the tomb first also went in, and he saw and believed. For as yet they did not understand the scripture that he must rise from the dead. Then the disciples returned to their homes, but Mary stood weeping outside the tomb. As she wept, she bent over to look into the tomb, and she saw two angels in white, sitting where the body of Jesus had been lying, one at the head and the other at the feet. They said to her, woman, why are you weeping? She said to them, they have taken away my Lord, and I do not know where they have laid him. When she said this, she turned around and saw Jesus standing there, but she did not know that it was Jesus. Jesus said to her, woman, why are you weeping? For whom are you looking? Supposing him to be the gardener, she said to him, Sir, if you have carried him away, tell me where you have laid him and I will take him. Jesus said to her, Mary. She turned and said to him in Hebrew, Rabboni, which means teacher. Jesus said to her, Do not hold on to me because I have not yet ascended to the Father. But go to my brothers and say to them, I am ascending to my Father and your Father, to my God and your God. Mary Magdalene went and announced to the disciples, I have seen the Lord. And she told them that he had said these things to her. The Gospel of the Lord. Come by here, my Lord, come by here. Come by here, my Lord, come by here. Come by here, my Lord, come by here. I've come to make an announcement this morning, and I imagine that's why so many of you are here on this Easter Sunday. You want to hear the announcement, and I'm gonna make it in just a few minutes. But first, I wanted us to think for a few moments about Mary Magdalene and the difference between being noticed and being known. Mary arrived at the cemetery while it was still dark. She found that the stone had been rolled away and the tomb was empty. She assumed that the body of Jesus had been stolen and she ran to tell Peter and the beloved disciple what she had found. 
Once she told them, they all three sprinted back to the cemetery. Peter was the first to walk into the empty tomb. He saw the grave clothes lying there and he left confused. The beloved disciple followed him into the empty tomb. He saw and he believed. What exactly he believed, we are not told. He believed. The two of them left the cemetery, leaving Mary Magdalene alone with her grief. She stood there weeping, and Jesus was there, but she didn't recognize him. He said to her, woman, why are you weeping? She supposed that he was the gardener. And she said, sir, if you know where they've taken my Lord's body, tell me so that I may go and get it. And that's when Jesus said, Mary. There was something in his voice. She recognized it. She knew it. And she embraced Jesus. Now, when you read John's gospel, you have to be aware of the symbolism that is there. For example, when you read the crucifixion story, you hear echoes from the book of Exodus. Jesus is very similar to the sacrificial lamb that is slain for the people. And like the sacrificial lamb whose no bone was broken, no bones were broken when Jesus died on the cross. And like Moses, who delivered the people out of slavery in Egypt, Jesus delivers the people out of slavery to sin and death. You see the parallels to Exodus. But by and large, John's gospel more echoes in its entirety, the book of Genesis. I mean, look at the way the book begins. In the beginning, he steals the words from the beginning of Genesis. What's the Jewish term for it? Chutzpah? He has parallels also throughout, culminating here in the resurrection story. There's a woman in the garden. There is death all around. What John is doing is he is telling us from the very beginning, I'm telling you a, a story of recreation. You know Genesis, you know how it started. I'm gonna tell you how it's being recreated through Jesus Christ. And we know the story from Genesis. Adam and Eve lived in a garden. They were tempted. The tempter showed up one day and said, do you want to be like God? They shrugged and said, well, we thought we already were like God. We're told we're God's children and God comes and walks with us every day in the garden. We must be like God. No, 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 you're not like God. God is way up here and you're way down here. And if you want to be like God, you've got to eat of the fruit of that tree. Oh, we can't eat of the fruit of that tree. That's the forbidden fruit. Oh, so now you know why it's forbidden. God doesn't want you to be like God. And you see the temptation. And they partake of the fruit of the tree and it's the physical manifestation of their sin. And immediately their eyes are opened and they realize we were in relationship with God and now we've fallen out of that relationship. We refer to that as the fall. And John is telling us, you know that story. Well, I'm here to tell you that Jesus is the new Adam. Jesus has come to set things right the way God intended it from the very beginning, and it is done through a relationship with Jesus Christ. That's what John's gospel is all about. Are you willing to go a little deeper with me this morning? Let's go a little deeper. Mary is in that garden, and Jesus, while she doesn't recognize Jesus, he recognizes her. 
And he says to her, woman, why are you weeping? The woman, why you are you weeping? It doesn't catch her attention. Uh, she's pleased to be recognized. She's pleased to be uh, noticed. You know how it is. You go into a store, you're looking for something. You can't find what you're looking for. And then some helpful salesperson notices that helpless look on your face and comes up and says, may I help you? Yes, you can help me. Thank you for noticing me. Thank you for recognizing I need help. That's what's happening at that level. She is noticed by Jesus, but there is no change in her. There is movement in this story. It goes from noticing Mary to knowing Mary. Jesus listens to her question, and he answers her by saying, Mary. There's something in the way that he said it, the fact that he knows her by name, the fact that he knows her life. Her eyes are open and she realizes it is Jesus and she grabs a hold to him and she has no intention of letting go. Every time I read that passage, I think of something that happened in my life years ago. I'd taken a study abroad when I was in college and had spent a month in Russia. And when I came home, we flew into the Atlanta airport. And in those days, you could actually go to the gate and wait for a loved one to get off the plane. And so when you stepped off the airplane and walked through that uh, skyway, you came out and there were people looking for their loved ones. When I came through the skyway and came to the gate, my mother was there. She went under the rope and sprinted across and grabbed me and held on to me. Security came over and said, do you know this person? I've never seen her before in my life. <laughs> of course I know this person, this is my mother. She has known me since the day I was born. No one knows me better than she does. That's the kind of experience that Mary had on that Easter morning. The person who knows her best is in front of her. Her eyes are open and she realizes it. And now that she is known, she is able to know and she's able to love and she is able to share. Mary understands better than most that being noticed pales in comparison to being known. But everywhere I go, it seems that a lot of people are settling for being noticed. You look at social media. People love it when their post is noticed. Uh, they love it when uh, they are friended by somebody. They, they love it when somebody likes what they've written or somebody retweets what they tweeted or re-Xs what they Xed. I don't know what you call it these days. But we get so caught up in being noticed. That's our hunger is to be noticed. And I think that's a part of that's okay. I mean, we're all different and we want to be noticed. You know how it is. Somebody says, I'm male, I'm female. I'm black, I'm white. I'm married, I'm unmarried. We know how it is when people label themselves. And sometimes our groups help us find identity. Uh, we find a group that we are able to connect with and that helps us to find our identity in the community. I love it when I'm out someplace and uh, in another town and I'm wearing my Braves cap and somebody comes, oh, are you a Braves fan? Yeah, I'm a Braves fan. Oh, are you? No, I'm a Phillies fan. I'm sorry to hear that. <laughs> we identify with our teams. We identify with our groups. And there's a part of that that's good, especially when your team, when your group has been marginalized, when it's been ignored, 
when your group has been forgotten, uh, when you don't get a promotion at work because of the color of your skin or because of your gender or because of your age, there's something wrong with that. And we need to notice people, we need to see people, we need to recognize people. But I think that there comes a place, a time, in which it's too much. And we allow our, the way we're described to define us. A number of years ago, our daughter was two and a half years old. We were at a Sunday school party. And at the party, she cut her toe, cut it pretty deeply. And so we had to leave the party. We scooped her up, we uh, bandaged her up, and we drove to the hospital. We got to the emergency room. I picked her up and I carried her into the emergency room and the doctor met us and the doctor put his hands out for her and I pulled back for a second and I asked that really important question. Are you a Democrat or a Republican? I mean, a parent's got to be very careful. We don't want the person taking care of our child to actually maybe cancel our vote out on election day. The doctor gave the wrong answer and I had to ask for a different doctor. No, 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 not true. That's not true. When you go to the hospital and you're in crisis, all those things that you think are important, they become very unimportant. And what was most important to us that day was could this doctor take care of our daughter? We get in trouble when we allow those things that describe us to define us. And what this story wants us to know is that we are not defined by our circumstances in life. We are defined by our relationship with the risen Christ. And so you may have certain descriptions that are applied to you. Somebody might say, I'm divorced. I'm dealing with addiction. I'm wrestling with depression. I'm unemployed. I'm homeless. Those are descriptions, but they do not define you. You are defined by your relationship with the risen Lord. That's what John wants us to know. Now, I know you're ready for the announcement, and, and I'll give it in just a minute, but I need to say one more thing this morning. And, and, and that is that for one brief moment, for one sacred moment in time, there was only one person who knew about the resurrection of Jesus. And you think about it, what's she going to do? She is the whole church at this point. The church is one person. What's she going to do? Is she going to keep it to herself and brood over it? Or is she going to share it with others and become, as the Roman Catholic Church labels Mary Magdalene, the apostle to the apostles? It all hinges on Mary of Magdala in this moment in time. Last October, a group of us from the church uh, took a trip to Turkey. We went to the ancient city of Ephesus. It is an incredible archaeological site. Uh, it has been rebuilt to the point where you actually walk on the marble streets uh, that people walked on in the first century. And there is a colonnade that runs right through the center of the city all the way down to where uh, the canal came into the city. And you can imagine the people that have walked up that path, that road. Alexander the Great, Mark Antony, Cleopatra, and the Apostle Paul. As we walk those marble streets, I let my mind wander and imagine what it was like for Paul to walk those streets. What did he see? What did he experience? Well, over there would be the temple of Artemis. 
one of the seven wonders of the ancient world. And over there is the theater of Ephesus. It seats 25,000 people. This is a city with 200,000 people living in it. Roman guards walking the streets, keeping the peace. It is a city filled with pagan people, worshiping in pagan temples. And Paul is a leader of a church of few dozen as I contemplated what it must have been like for Paul I thought about it it, it seems daunting it seems improbable it seems imposing it seems hopeless but then my mind came back from Paul's day to our day and I looked around and what I saw was the remnants of the Roman Empire in ruins. The people in Paul's day thought that Rome was eternal, that the empire would never fall. And as I looked at it, it was gone. And as I look around today, I know that two billion Christians are going to gather in worship to celebrate the resurrection of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. We look back and on that day, that resurrection day, it was one person, Mary Magdalene. And we now look around and see how it's going. Two billion people. And that brings me to the announcement. Are you ready? Christ is risen. Mary Magdalene went and told her friends, I have seen the Lord. And that set off a chain reaction that is continuing to this day. Mary told Peter and the beloved disciple and her friends, and as a result, Peter's life was changed. And on Pentecost Day, he stood on the teaching steps and he preached the message. And on that day, in that place, at that time, the church was started. And because the church was started, a man by the name of Saul of Tarsus had his life transformed and he became the Apostle Paul. And because his life was transformed, he took the gospel to Rome and to the ends of the earth. And because the gospel went to the ends of the earth, it made its way to England. And in England, the gospel touched the life of a man by the name of John Wesley. And John Wesley was a part of a great awakening that was sent here to America. Two of the key players in that, Thomas Koch and Francis Asbury. And they established the Methodist Church in this country in 1784. And it began to spread up and down the eastern seaboard. And that great awakening came to the colony of Georgia. And in 1830, the North Georgia Conference was established. And in 1925, Peachtree Road Methodist Church was founded. That's how it started. This is how it's going. We are here because of that chain reaction, because Mary Magdalene said to her few friends, I have seen the Lord. So the question that people ask me is, do you believe in the resurrection? With every fiber in my being, do you believe in the resurrection? If you do, I want you to be like Mary and tell somebody. There's somebody in your life that's struggling. They're in pain. They're experiencing disappointment or loss. And they need a friend. They need somebody who will first notice them, but make the further step and get to know them and help them to know they are known by God that the way things are now is not the way they have to remain, that God's kingdom is at work. A new beginning has been established. 
listen to them, pray for them, and when the time is right, when you think they can hear it, tell them Christ is risen. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. And now I invite you to stand with me as we affirm our faith together by saying the Apostles' Creed. Let us unite in this historic confession of our Christian faith. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. The third day he arose from the dead, he ascended into heaven, and sitteth at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. You may be seated. At this time, we invite the ushers forward for our morning offering. As we continue to worship this morning, we ask that you please register your attendance. You'll lo- notice the um, red, ritual, uh, red Ritual Christian Fellowship attendance pads at the end of each pew. If you could pass them down and fill out the information, we would love to know that you were here this morning. And God offers his love generously to all, and we are called to respond and give generously in return. There are many in our local communities and around the world that are very grateful for your generosity. In your bulletin, you'll notice that there's an insert for a special Lenten offering, and we invite you to give generously to support our local outreach here in Atlanta. 100% of that goes towards supporting our local ministry partners. And also, if you're worshiping with us online, we invite you to give via the church website or the app or by mailing a check here to Peachtree Road, United Methodist Church. Let us pray. Most gracious God, every good gift comes from your generosity. As disciples of the risen Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, we stand resolute in our commitment to live by your example of charity. In gratitude for your good gifts, we dedicate our tithes and offerings this morning to you. In Jesus Christ's name we pray, amen.
that we are about to sing was written by Charles Wesley 
and it is the text from 1 Corinthians chapter 15. It is one of the great hymns of the church, and we have an opportunity to sing it now. The words are printed in your program, and we will sing all three stanzas. Rejoice, the Lord is King. Several years ago, I had Dr. Don Sellers preach from this pulpit, and he, I'll never forget the opening line of his sermon. He said, never take this for granted. Was he talking about the beauty of this sanctuary for, with its stained glass windows, the beautiful flowers that had been arranged by our flower guild? Was he talking about the beautiful music of our musicians? Was he talking about the warm fellowship of our congregation? Yes, he was talking about all of it. And we should never take this for granted. And we actually do this every week here at Peachtree Road. <laughs> Receive God's blessing. Now may the grace of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, the love of God and the fellowship and communion of the Holy Spirit be with you both now and forevermore. And may the peace of Christ be always with you.
Thank you for worshiping this Easter morning at Peachtree Road United Methodist Church in Atlanta, Georgia. It doesn't get any better than this. Singing together, Christ the Lord is risen today. The beautiful music by the chancel choir. The reading of the Easter story from the Gospel of John. And just now, the singing of the Hallelujah Chorus. I hope you found this service to be helpful. Next Sunday, the celebration continues. We will recognize the babies born into our congregation within the last year and offer a blessing upon them. Thank you for your prayerful support of the ministry of this great church. Your generous gifts enable us to accomplish so much in the name of Christ. Now may God bless you and keep you.